All right. All right, so the recording has started. This is Bio 208. We are officially in week seven. We are done with unit one. I uh, just wanted to let you know that um, for unit one, I did add back five points on both your test and your lab. With the five points, our averages were about where they normally are in the um, 70, 69, 70, 72 range. So good job keeping the class moving. Um, part of the reason why I added the points back, I know at times uh, between the question and what the line's pointing at, on lab especially, it can be a little tricky over maybe what I was trying to get you to ask or answer. And I know sometimes um, with the timing and with doing with the monitoring, you know, there's a little bit of added stress that maybe um, makes you rush a little bit more or maybe makes you have that rushed feeling. And so um, so that was part of the reason why everybody should have gotten the five points back. I did make a mistake, and one student already caught it. Uh, when I was adding the five points back, I pushed a six instead of an eight. So instead of getting an 88, they got a 68 or something. So do double check and make sure what the points you had, what the test score now reflects, is about a five point increase on both. On both. Um, as we move into uh, the next unit, which is going to be Chapter 22, we're moving into lymphatics and immunity. Just remember that this cardiovascular material, we're going to revisit it. So we're going to talk in this next chapter, how do we make lymph? Well, lymph comes from the interstitial fluid. And interstitial fluid, remember, came from that capillary hydrostatic pressure pushing fluid out and causing a net filtration pressure at the capillary. So when we want to make more or less lymphatic fluid, it comes back to, well, what is the pressure of the fluid in the capillary? What's the oncotic pressure in the capillary? Or what's the total blood pressure? Okay. We're going to see this material again when we get back into urinary as we look at, again, the hormones and their effect on water balance. Um, and then we'll hit, again, some information on ions and uh, acid base and how they help influence um, not just the breathing and the control of whether we're acidic or basic, but they're going to have a, a play in whether, again, oncotics and what's the osmolarity and how do we, again, retain water or dump water uh, based on those factors. And then blood pressure, it's so important that you have the ability to, again, manipulate the radius and the arterioles, uh, especially in the male reproductive system, to get an erection. And so it kind of was a joke, you know, poor males who who have hypertension, in many cases have some form of cardiovascular disease, some of the reasons or the ways it manifests as a symptom is they are no longer able to have erections. So that's kind of, again, our talking points for you can't forget the system. Um, and when you become a nurse, chances are uh, most of your patients will have some form of cardiovascular disease and plus whatever else you're treating them. Okay, so I went through the lymphatics and immunity slides, and all I did was try to con compress them a little bit into uh, a fewer number so it would make it easier to download and do the lecture. Um, so, again, for the inf introduction of Chapter 22, um, the organ system is the lymphatics organ system. So when we talk about the lymphatics organ system, we're talking about we have fluid being collected from the capillary leaking out, that fluid has to get back into the cardiovascular system. So that fluid has to be collected through capillaries that are more open network, more of an open mesh work that can basically kind of funnel the fluid into bigger vessels. And those vessels are going to dump back into the cardiovascular system and keep our blood plasma versus formed elements at around that 60-40, you know, target for hematocrit. Uh, and return that fluid to the system. But as we return to the system, if your cardiovascular blood moving in the system is like your expressway and your like HOV lanes that are moving at the speed limit or faster, um, the lymphatic system is going to be your side roads, your fontage roads, your, your side roads that have more stoplights and more um, 
more yields and traffic circles to slow you down. Okay, it's more speed bumps. And those speed bumps are going to be some of your tissues and organs that are going to, as the fluid is heading back to the cardiovascular system, going to be an opportunity for this large population of immune cells and many of the immune cells here are lymphocytes, that's why we call it the lymphatic system. Uh, these lymphocytes and then these other immune cells are gonna have the ability to basically search through and filter and assess if we are healthy or not and if we have pathogens, ev invasions of viruses, bacteria, fungus, single-celled organisms, you know, or larger cell organisms uh, trying to take up residence and wreak havoc in our bodies. Okay, so um, so the lymphatic system is taking again the fluid that's leaked out of the capillaries and eventually getting it back to the cardiovascular system. But as we're bringing it back, doing a good check on it and really cleaning it up and removing some of the um, potentially hazardous material and cells and items that might be trying to, again, hitch a ride and change their location and change their circumstances uh, from where they may be originated or where they may be gained access into our bodies. All right. Now, the immune system is kind of this funny system that because many cells of the immune system are lymphocytes, we kind of lump them into talking about here, but the immune system, we have immune cells in the skin, in the airways, in the digestive tract. So anywhere that immune cells tend to take up residence is considered part of the immune system. Um, so it's not a true separate entity. Uh, it's kind of a, a system of cells and what the cells do and the products the cells produce and they live everywhere and they do this one function and we group them into the lymphatic system because lymphatic organs and tissues are where high amounts or high density populations of lymphatic cells and other immune cells tend to live. Okay, so it's kind of this weird, again, semantics of it's kind of an organ system, the immune system, but it's not a true organ system, and we lump it in with the lymphatics, okay? All right, so when we think of it that way, we're gonna first focus on this chapter and focus in lab on the lymphatic organs, tissues, and cells. And so when you think about what do I need to know for lab, the parts you need to know for lab are the parts that play a role in being a lymphatic cell, so all of your white blood cells, so that blood board will come out again. All of the places, the white blood cells, and especially the T cells, B cells, natural killer cells, those lymphatic cell populations tend to congregate. So that'll be lymphatic tissues and organs, all right? And when we look at where, what is considered a lymphatic tissue, the difference between a tissue and an organ is does it have one blood vessels coming in? So does it have its, it's like a small artery and a small vein coming into and out of the organ? A tissue will not have its own blood supply. It'll just have some type of pressing in capillary bed to that area and not necessarily its own dedicated vessel, um, artery and vein. All right. Second thing between a tissue and an organ is going to be the capsule. There's going to be some type of dense, fibrous, irregular connective tissue that is going to form a capsule of some sort to encase the inside lymphocytes, immune cells, and fluid of the lymphatic system that's flowing through. Okay. So, you look for a capsule and you look for some type of dedicated blood supply. So when we do use that definition, your lymphatic organs, if we're looking at our little sheet here, we are gonna have the uh, spleen is the main one and the spleen has the splenatic artery and vein, all right? And it is a capsule, there's a defined, dense, irregular, fibrous, collagen-rich, connective tissue that forms the outside of the spleen. So it is considered an organ, all right? The other organ, uh, the appendix is, again, part of the large intestines, but 
it's going to be an area again that has a capsule it has some blood vessels coming to it and it's an area that we tend to congregate a lot of lymphatic cells so it can be considered a lymphatic organ and it's a part also of the digestive tract, okay? And it's a digestive organ. So it's kind of like the pancreas. It falls in both places, okay? And then the next big organ that's a little bit tricky is going to be the thymus gland, all right? Now, usually when you think gland, you think, oh, it's an endocrine organ. This gland has epithelial cells. So remember, epithelial cells, if they're square or squamous, their goal is to form some type of tubing or some type of space, some type of area where blood vessels and uh, fluids of the body are separated, all right? So what's inside this little pod or this little pore here in the thymus gland is a water area where we let T cells develop. So the thymus gland has epithelial tissue in large amounts, but inside the little pod or the little puddle that's made, that is where we're going to find a large population of T lymphocytes. And part of the reason why they get the name T cells is because they develop and mature and become immunocompetent in the thymus gland. All right, and the cells that are lymphocytes that are known as B cells and natural killer cells. Part of the reason why we name them B cells is because they stay in the bone marrow, those lymphocytes to develop. All right. So the thymus gland is going to be a unique organ in that it's mostly epithelial tissue and the T developing lymphocytes. It has nothing to do with fighting a pathogen in terms of immediate effect right now. Uh, and it is going to be mainly existing um, for development of T cells, but there's an interesting quadri of as we grow, if I tried, and most of us that are full-grown adults tried to find your thymus gland, I wouldn't find a very big gland because the gland does not really grow with us as we age and as we gain in size. So that leaves us with this uh, issue of the thymus gland is where originally it was published and thought that T cells have to go to become competent, mature cells. But as we grow and as we continue to make T cells for the rest of our life, this gland does not get bigger. It does not continue to be that much of a big hub. Uh, so there has to be another way that we let T cells potentially grow and develop and become immunocompetent. And there's got to be another mechanism of becoming immunocompetent because natural killer cells are considered to be immunocompetent cells. And there's a theory out there that some B cells are immunocompetent and they never go to the thymus gland to become mature cells. So it leaves us some interesting, again, future PhD work for anybody that wants to pursue that. All right. But the thymus gland is a gland of the, uh, I'm sorry, is a organ of the lymphatic system because one, it's going to have its own blood supply, an artery and a vein coming in and out of it. Two, it has a capsule that's made up of some type of connective tissue to define it and set it apart from the other uh, fat cells and tissues and organs around it. Three, it's got a high density of T cells inside of it that are developing. So that is why it's considered a lymphatic organ, but it is not going to be a place where we're putting lymphatic fluid and trying to send fluid into to be able to be cleansed of potential pathogens. So that's where it's a little different from some of our other organs that have the ability to see lymphatic fluid fluid and as it sees lymphatic fluid, uh, filter it, clean it, and remove particles, pathogens, and proteins, and toxins that might be in our system. Okay? All right. And then the last big organ of the system is going to be all of your lymph nodes. All right. And your lymph nodes are usually going to be designated as a little circular um, 
nodule, all right? And uh, this will be something that we'll look at on the models as well as look at the pictures. And it's going to, again, have a blood vessel coming in and out. It is going to have a dense, irregular, collagen-rich capsule that defines it. Um, and, I mean, most of us have been to the doctor where they, you know, feel when you have a cold, they feel under your throat and around your neck, and they're feeling to see are your lymph nodes in the cervical region, the neck region, are they enlarged? Or sometimes here, like people have enlarged lymph nodes in their armpits or in their groin, all right? So those are, again, little capsules full of T cells and B cells. And again, when you're fighting a pathogen, when you're fighting off an infection or something is happening, um, we don't need to purchase anything right now. You need to go do your work, phonics please, and I will hold this until my meeting's over. All right. I forgot what I was saying. Lymph nodes, okay. And so it's, a, it's an organ, and it has lots of T cells, B cells. It has lots of um, antibodies produced by B cells. And those cells, again, when they're active against an infection, active against a virus and a bacteria, and it could be potentially doing multiple virus and bacterial uh, actions as, you know, they're working against multiple pathogens. Um, T cells and B cells can be going through mitosis and be going through rapid growth as they make more and more antibody products. All right. And so, Alexandra, I'm on a meeting and you do not need you. You need to go eat some lunch then or go have a snack because mommy is on her meeting and you do not need to have your phone or an iPad right now. I apologize. And I lost my train of thought. Okay, so lymph nodes are an organ. All right, tissues. Tissues are going to be less encapsulated, less structural, less of an entity that you could potentially like grab and pull out. All right, your uh, tonsils are considered tissue. Um, and then you'll see that these areas in and around the uh, the abdominal pelvic region that are usually tied to the abdominal, I'm sorry, the digestive tract are going to also be tissues. And we'll call some of them, when they're associated with the mucosa, there'll be a malt. And when they're associated more so with your, um, your lining of your small intestines, there'll be a Peyer's patch, okay, malts and pulse, all right? So, again, anywhere we have a lymphatic organ, a lymphatic tissue, we expect to see a high amount of lymphatic cells. And the lymphatic cells of the immune system that we're really honing in or in high population and high numbers are going to be T cells, B cells, and or natural killer cells. Okay? So, Again, what is the purpose of the lymphatic system? You have fluid leaking out of your capillaries, and you need to get that fluid back into the cardiovascular system to keep the formed elements in the plasma around that 60-40 or 45-55 ratio. Okay, you don't want every time blood goes through a capillary to leak out fluid, and it just continues to get thicker and thicker and thicker as there's less fluid to suspend the formed elements. So the lymphatic system is about returning that fluid. Okay, so as your picture shows up here, right, and it should show in your slides, everywhere you have a capillary bed and everywhere capillary beds leak out because of our net filtration pressure equation, and again, that's because the capillary hydrostatic pressure of the fluid in the capillary, and that could be because the fluid, why did she turn the TV on? I'm sorry, it's really distracting. Um, stand by. I think she's just trying to torture me because I didn't give her the phone. Okay, so net filtration pressure. You have fluid forces pushing out, and again, the reason why we push fluid out is because the capillary has a lot of blood in it because the arterial has dilated, and or we have a lot of high blood pressure at the left ventricle pushing into the um the aorta and that higher than normal mean pressure with the standard loss of pressure as you move through the different segments of the vascular tree all right 
is going to bleed off, but by the time we get to the capillary, which should be maybe a pressure on the arterial side of 31 or 32, is maybe at 35 or 36, that's going to mean more fluid leaks out. All right? So everywhere we have capillaries, we tend to have lymphatic system there to collect the fluid. All right? And so as this picture up here shows you, the capillaries on the lymphatic side, they are going to be like capillaries of our cardiovascular system where they are full of simple squamous cells, but the simple squamous cells here are going to have more openings, more pores that could allow the fluid to move into it, and those openings and pores are going to potentially let bigger items move into it. So this is how some of our immune cells could move in and out of the interstitial space. This is how bacteria, pathogens, fungus, viruses, small little amoebas or little worms could also move from the interstitial space that they get in because of a cut on your finger. They could move into this capillary network and then have a roadway towards your heart and towards being spread out to further farther away locations and places okay so the capillaries here look very similar from a structural point of view as a capillary of a cardiovascular network right the difference is the simple squamous epithelial cells are going to have a little bit more opening and space in some of the gaps that are going to let not only fluid leak in but let items such as cells, so if a cell turns cancerous and it wants to leave the location it currently resides, like in your liver or in your pancreas or your ovaries, it could potentially break away, jump into the lymphatic capillary, and now it has a roadway, it has a, a pathway that it can potentially move and then go take up residence somewhere else. All right? Um, and the as the roadways get a little bit bigger, lymphatic capillaries are going to turn into lymphatic vessels. Lymphatic vessels are going to be very much like veins. Why? There's no pump here. So like veins, to get fluid and whatever is suspended in the fluid, whether that's particles, amino acids, hormones, little toxic particles, little bacterial phages, whatever it is. Those molecules in the fluid are going to move because of the pressure gradient that we have. So to create a pressure gradient, just like in veins, as we get into some of our bigger vessels, we're going to see the epithelial lining of the lymphatic vessels are going to form valves, just like they did in our tunica intima layer of our veins. All right. And the vessels of our lymphatics are usually going to run with the veins, and they are going to then get to utilize the skeletal muscle pump system, just like veins did. And so, again, just like pushing and exercising moves blood back to your heart, a little bit of movement and exercise also will push on these lymphatic vessels and help move your fluid back towards your heart to be, again, dumped back into the cardiovascular system. So if anyone has ever like felt like their fingers got really, really frozen or really, really swollen, maybe on a hot day or something, you feel like you're just, your fingers feel really swollen and you start to move them. And by moving them, you're trying to like get the fluid to leave that area. Well, part of what you're doing is you're trying to push on those lymphatic vessels and that accumulated interstitial fluid and push it into the lymphatic system. And then in the lymphatic system, using valves and using that muscle pump, you're trying to move that fluid out of that area and towards your heart, okay? And then it can get, get dumped back in with your, um, with your cardiovascular system, dumped back in and become part of the plasma again. Okay. Now, um, eventually the lymphatic vessels are going to turn into bigger lymphatic vessels and the target is going to be near the subclavian and the jugular, so where the big vessel coming down from your neck and the big vessel coming back from your arms and your lower body, there is going to be a juncture and a little doorway on the right and left side where the lymphatic fluid is going to dump back in. 
okay? And as the picture shows, the fluid that ends up in your legs, ends up in your belly, ends up in your left arm and the left side of your face, all of that fluid is going to come back and be moved towards a doorway on the left jugular, left subclavian little juncture, um, and that's going to be known as your thoracic duct. And remember, the duct is kind of like a one-way valve. Fluid can go into the cardiovascular system. It can't flow backwards. All right, so that is how we're going to get fluid to join back into your venous blood and help again bring venous blood back to being about 60% plasma and 40% formed elements. All right, on the right, si right side, all right, the entryway is going to be known as the right lymphatic duct and you can see from this little picture over here the fluid comes back from the right arm the right breast and chest area and then the right neck and head region okay and so those are the two ways that the fluid that was collected from lymphatic capillaries at the capillary beds throughout your entire body all right uh, how do we get that fluid collected slowly back into the cardiovascular system. And there's a long way from maybe some of the capillaries in my toes, in my fingers, in my belly uh, to, to return. There's a long distance to travel. And so that as I go back towards that lymphatic duct, right lymphatic duct or thoracic duct, I'm going to take advantage of making little stop points, making little, um, what do you call it, traffic circles, speed bumps. And those speed bumps are going to be lymphatic nodes. And the lymphatic nodules, lymphatic nodes, are going to be specialized organs where the fluid is going to come in and then the fluid is going to spread out. And as it spreads out, it's going to interact with a ton of immune cells. Some of those immune cells have been turned on, so they're already activated and looking for a certain pathogen. So maybe some of them have already been activated to look for and make um, antibodies against flu virus or streptococcus A or blah, 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 all right, or whereas some of the immune cells might still be what we call naive and they haven't been activated yet, they haven't been introduced or shown that a new pathogen is in our system and they're waiting for that opportunity to be turned on and then activated and turned into a killing cell or an antibody producing cell that then starts to say, hey, we got fungus A in us, now let's go and find everywhere fungus A is and kill it. Okay. Um, we're going to see that the lymph nodes tend to be high density in the neck because lots of things between the nose, the mouth, the ears, and the skin, and the heart exist. So that's a big region for a lot of lymph nodes. Uh, we'll see a bunch in our armpits and around our breast area. Uh, again, because if anything comes in from the fingers and the hand and the chest, that would be the way it gets to the heart. We're going to see a lot in the abdominal pelvic area because, again, a lot of entryways uh, for that, especially especially with the digestive tract. We're going to see a lot around our, ver our vertebra for, again, blood vessels coming into and out of uh, capillary beds for the major organs and then trying to get back maybe towards the, again, heart. And then we'll see some in the groin area, again, because of our toes, our feet, and, again, the lower pelvic floor region that has some entry and exit points with our urethra, our anus, and then in women, the vagina. Um, and so it tends to be... Um, if there's an issue with entryway for a pathogen, usually the lymph nodes closest to the entry point are going to be the ones that expand and activate and find the pathogen first. So that's why if you have a cold or a, um, a respiratory or something with uh, maybe you ingested something food-wise in the mouth, that's why, again, the lymph nodes um, – for any pathogen in the face and the neck area tend to activate and, and upregulate the cells in the lymph nodes in and around your neck region. So that's why when you have strep, the lymph nodes and the tonsils are going to react. When you have some type of air cold that you caught, again, the lymph nodes and the sinuses and those areas are going to activate. If I got some type of pathogen 
from a cut in my finger, chances are my lymph nodes in my armpit might be the more likely place to then activate and uh, be the satellite and the and the big kind of flashing light saying, here's this pathogen and we found it first, okay? So when we, you treat patients, it might be, be because the area closest to where the pathogen is trying to enter and migrate from, that's the lymph node that should hopefully catch it first. When we talk about this and lymph nodes as cancer helping us find where the cancers are coming from, again, the lymph nodes closest to maybe where the cancer cell originated and thus the cancer cell is trying to uh, migrate away from, they would potentially be the first lymph nodes closest to that area that highlight. So when we think of breast cancers, a lot of time when women have a mastectomy, the breast cancer is originating in the mammillary uh, glands, those cells that start to turn rogue and start to try to leave and migrate away, they're going to jump into capillary for the lymphatic system because remember the epithelial tissue in those capillaries are more open and this cell can push through, whereas other types of ways to move around, it's more difficult because there's more of a, a roadway with epithelial and other types of tissues forming barriers. So those cancerous cells leaving the breast are going to tend to end up in the axillary, in the chest area, and when we go and we dissect, to make sure maybe the cancer is all contained, we'll sometimes take the lymph nodes nearest to the breast tumor with it out, and they'll test and see were any of the cancer cells in those lymph nodes. And if they were, we know that the breast cancer tried to migrate away. If the lymph nodes are clean, then we know the breast cancer was confined and hopefully did not migrate and move away. Okay, so lymph nodes are a great way to not only see maybe where an infection is maybe trying to gain access. Somebody posted on the chat, their kid had an ear infection. So, of course, the, the tonsils closest to the eustachian tube, the adenoids, they're probably huge, all right? And then some of the lymph nodes in the neck and in the under jaw area are probably also huge as, again, that bacteria causing that infection tries to hitch a ride with the fluid as it exits out the station tube into the back of the pharynx, the larynx, and tries to, again, find a different entryway to a different location in the body where it can propagate and grow. All right, so that's kind of a lot of information on how the lymphatic vessels are very similar to our cardiovascular vessels, how the lymphatic vessels like the veins have to utilize valves and skeletal muscle pumps to get fluid back. And then the points where we bring the fluid back, most of the body is coming through the thoracic duct. And then that right arm, right chest, right head region is coming in through the right lymphatic duct. All right. And if there's some type of issue where the fluid can't get back, and the fluid starts to accumulate in the lymphatic system, that's when we potentially end up with a thing called lymphedema. Okay, and again, a complication of when we go in for breast cancers, especially breast cancers, and we take out a lot of the lymph nodules into the armpit area, as you take those lymph nodes out, you start to, again, kind of make cuts and breaks in the ability of the system to bring fluid past that point and back into the thoracic duct or the right lymphatic duct. And so one of the major, major issues we see with a post-surgical complication for mastectomies, and depending on how many of the lymph vessels and the lymph nodes have been taken out and destroyed in that, that surgical procedure, is what's known as lymphedema. And it's a edema, a collection of fluid that accumulates in the interstitial, in the skin, and causes turgor pressure, and like this picture shows, causes swelling, all right, that is because the lymphatic system is not adequately returning that fluid back to the cardiovascular system. And so what you see post-surgical, if you're going to work with, again, a plastic surgeon and a surgeon who's taking away breast tissue, is the post-surgical sleeve, and it might be because the woman is going to deal with this lymphedema for the rest of her life because too many and so many of the lymphatic uh, nodules were taken out and the
lymphatic vessels are damaged. She's going to have to wear compression clothing on her arm, and she's going to have to every hour get into a habit of doing, you know, some arm movements and even using gravity to help return that fluid back towards what is still intact for lymphatic capillaries, lymphatic vessels, and return that fluid back to the lymph thoracic system. All right. Um, in the in the Middle East or in East Asia, there is some type of pathogen. It's like a worm or a flu. This is why you don't drink the water in certain countries. And supposedly this pathogen will get into the groin area and it will block the return of fluid through the lymphatic vessels in multiple places and it will cause again lymphedema and because the foot and the leg will get so big it looks like an elephant's leg they call it elephantitis if you really want to be grossed out do not do this with children around but google elephantitis and remember your skin is again a, an organ and as it stretches out and as the water behind that skin is nice and warm uh, anytime you get cuts and anytime you get you know scratches pathogens are going to dump in that lymphatic area in that uh, interstitial fluid and now there's a warm stationary fluid that doesn't move and it's higher risk for pathogens to propagate and it's just it's disgusting and then the skin is so distended and think about it, these people can't move because they can't move their legs and then they get dirty and smelly and gross and it's just disgusting all right and it's all because of a little pathogen a little worm uh, so yes this can this lymphedema can happen because we screw up the lymphatic system because of surgery because we damage it when we're trying maybe to remove tumors and find out if tumors have spread um, but it also ha is a location where we know pathogens can happen all right um, and pathogens can take up residence and then block all the downstream return of fluid and it can be gross yes it can be super super gross all right and for those of you, again, that are going to work or want to be around the whole breast uh, mastectomy, breast reconstruction, you are going to see, I mean, these poor, and, and it's getting to a place where we now can test beforehand for the BRCA gene. And like, I can go get a genetic test and be like, oh, I have this BRCA gene. I'm going to elect to have a mastectomy. Um, and at least that way, I don't maybe take out the lymph nodes and I don't have the lymphedema. But if, let's say, because cancers happen, I have to have, I find a lump and now I have to get the breast tissue removed and I have to get some of the lymphatic nodules in and around it removed to make sure this node, this, this, tumor has not metastasized, um, I set up for higher incidence and higher risk that I'm probably going to have lymphedema develop and I'm going to deal with that for the rest of my life. All right, so the summary on the anatomy, again, some of our major organs, the spleen, the thymus gland, some of our major tissues, tonsils, and you are going to need to know them, and we're going to talk about them in lab on Thursday and Tuesday. Malts and Pyers patches, they, all, uh, they don't get specific names like the tonsils, just collectively the malts and the Pyers patches. Um, major vessels are going to look like veins, all right? And we're going to learn about the cells, again, the T cells and the B cells and the natural killer cells. And then we're going to go even one step further when we get more into the immune system and talk about all the cells of the immune system. Okay, so um, I'm going to stop.